So, welcome to the sixth Maddingley Lecture. The Maddingley Lectures are the University's Institute of Continuing Education's public lecture series here at Maddingley Hall. I'm Dr. Rebecca Lingwood, uh, Director of Continuing Education, and first I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce our chair for tonight, Professor Gordon Smith, um, so that I can allow him to introduce our speaker, Baroness Ruth Deach, and to chair the questions at the end of tonight's lecture. Professor Gordon Smith is head of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynaecology here at the University of Cambridge. He studied at Glasgow University and graduated in medicine in 1990. He then obtained subspecialist accreditation in maternal fetal medicine in 2001. Gordon undertakes clinically orientated research as well as basic science research and is also a principal investigator for a major cohort study in first pregnancies. He's a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences and also a clinical professor at UTMB in Texas in America. So before handing over to Gordon, could I please just remind you that if you have mobile phones, to switch them off at this point. So thank you, welcome. So thanks uh, very much for the introduction there, Rebecca, and it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Baroness Ruth Deach uh, to uh, speak uh, to us tonight. Um, Baroness Deach is an academic, a lawyer, and a bioethicist. Uh, she taught for more than 20 years at Oxford University in law and was principal of St Anne's College. Uh, she was a governor of the BBC from 2002 to 2006. Uh, she was uh, in the Rhodes Scholarships, uh, one of the trustees. Um, she's been called to the barn as an honorary bencher of the Inner Temple, uh, and uh, she was elected to the House of Lords and is on the Lords Communication Select Committee, uh, which considers the media and creative uh, industries. Uh, from 2004 to 2008, she was independent adjudicator for higher education in England and Wales. Uh, in 2008, she was appointed Professor of Law at Gresham College, and she gives about six lectures uh, of various subjects relating to the law uh, each year. Uh, and importantly, in 2009, elected to the uh, Bar Standards Board uh, regulating barristers' training, uh, practice, and uh, conduct. Um, now, when we're thinking in healthcare, we're always thinking in terms of uh, rankings and lists. Uh, so I noted interest in 1999, the Observer newspaper named her as the 107th most powerful person in Britain. <laughs> in 2001, uh, she was placed number 26 in Channel 4's The God List, uh, which ranked the 50 people of faith in Britain who exercise the most power and influence over our lives. Uh, presumably God's number one there. And it also makes you think the other 106 most powerful people in Britain must represent a lot, rather ungodly crew, as they're not above her in The God List. Uh, now, aside from her uh, real expertise in family law, uh, which eminently qualifies her to talk to us tonight. She was also uh, chair of the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority from 1994 to 2002. Uh, this is an organization which is facing some threats under the so-called bonfire of the Quangos. Uh, and if the bonfire of the Quangos really does destroy that institution, I think they'll reflect that they had a very fine piece of furniture which unfortunately ended up uh, being used for firewood. Maybe that's one of the things that uh, she'll talk to us tonight, but uh, I'm, sure I, I'm sure you are looking forward as much as I am uh, to hearing her speak uh, on playing God, uh, who should regulate reproductive medicine. I should add that, um, to the kind introduction, that when I was, was number 106 on, the, on that list of uh, powerful people, I was one below David Beckham and uh, one above Anne Widdicombe, <laughs> which was a rather difficult sandwich to be in, as you can imagine. Um, I'm very pleased and proud to be invited to lecture here in Cambridge. This is the university that rejected me my husband and my daughter, one by one, at various times in the past. So I'm pleased finally to make it into Cambridge University. And the topic I've chosen gives me a chance to speak about the achievement of which I'm most proud in a varied career, namely the part played by the Human Fertilization 
an embryology authority, HFEA as we call it, in the legalization and fostering of embryonic stem cell research in this country about 10 years ago. It also gives me the opportunity to participate in continuing education here, a topic which is of considerable interest to me in my current post as chair of the Bar Standards Board. The continuing education that barristers have to undertake has been the subject of a recent review, causing us all to think about how one assesses it in terms of hours and outcomes, and how to make continuing education accessible to all sorts of professionals in their busy lives, and what risks there are to the public if it's not undertaken. Although I'm talking about scientific research and reproductive medicine tonight, I am not a scientist. I've never passed any science exams at all, I'm sorry to say, and my involvement with the HFEA was certainly an enriching form of continuing education at a mature age. I was chair from 1994 to 2002, and during my tenure, the members included a bishop, a rabbi, and an actress. I had just become acquainted with the ins and outs of reproductive science in the first years of my chairmanship when we received the news in 1997 of the birth of Dolly the sheep, the first cloned mammal, here she is, now sadly deceased. There was worldwide pride at this British success, but there was some shock and concern too that there might be further cloning of people. And the doomsayers were in the majority at first. By law, all embryo research has to take place under the aegis of the HFEA. And we quickly learned from our scientific members that there was good cloning and bad cloning, or as we called it then, therapeutic cloning and reproductive cloning. A paper put out by the HFEA in 1998, largely authored by the late lamented Dayman McLaren, was called Cloning Issues in Reproductive Science and Medicine. And it recommended that the UK legalise the extraction of stem cells and legalise research into them and mitochondrial problems. It was endorsed by the Chief Medical Officer and every other high-level scientific academy, and legislation followed a couple of years later after extended debate in both Houses of Parliament. I didn't really believe that it would happen, for although there were scientific lobbies in favour, and disabled people rallied outside Parliament, hoping for life-changing research to be allowed. There was also strong opposition from those opposed to any tampering with nature and with the development of an embryo in the womb. I well remember being at a party the night the legislation passed, and the vote was announced on the radio, and I embraced Colin Blakemore, who was another guest, who was waiting as anxiously as I was for that result to come through. By stem cells, I refer to the possibilities that may arise from the growth of individual cells taken from an embryo. You can also take them from adult cells, which is less controversial, though most scientists think that embryonic cells offer more promise. The initial fertilized embryo is totipotent. That means it can and will grow into whole organisms. But after about four days of growth, one cell taken from an embryo, that's the, the third one down, sometimes known as a blastocyst at that stage, can be allowed to grow or can be coaxed to grow into one organ of the body that needs refreshing. Such a cell is called pluripotent, as you see on, on the left of this diagram. And you may have seen pictures in the papers occasionally of an ear grown on a mouse or you may have read of stem cells being used to regenerate a larynx or other organ that has failed. If the embryo is cloned, its product will probably not be rejected by the body from which it's taken, for it has no DNA other than the recipients. In the normal case of a transplant, the body will fight to reject it, as it's perceived as a stranger organ, and you probably know that someone who has a transplant will need continuing suppressive treatment to ensure acceptance. And as we all get older and our various bits and pieces fail, I personally look forward to the possibility of refreshed brain cells, eye cells, 
hearing cells, and all the other bits that are crumbling fast. The changes in the law in 2001 legalized research on embryos for purposes connected not only with reproduction, but with the cure of disease. The great change was that Britain had accepted and allowed embryo work for reproduction. The leap forward was, and it's for the cure of disease and new organs. It led to a golden age for British embryonic research, and we were able to attract scientists over from the USA, where George Bush had put in, a, in place a ban on federal funding, and I'll, I'll come back in a moment to the Obama position. George Bush put in a ban on federal funding for work on new embryonic stem cells. I often wondered whether the Bush ban was because he was going along with the sentiments of the very much more religious population of the states. Whenever I lecture there, the first question is always, when does the soul enter the body? Isn't it at the moment of conception? Nobody ever asks me that here. This is a rather secular society in Britain, apart from a few small pockets. Or perhaps the Bush ban was designed to help private business which was left able to pursue embryonic research with its own resources, whereas universities needing federal funds were held back. I think that Bush might just have been worried that another Bill Clinton might be cloned. Bill Clinton used to visit Oxford quite regularly when Chelsea Clinton, his daughter, was there, and a very good student she was too. And Bill Clinton used to like visiting pubs and he would have a glass of beer. And as soon as he'd finished, his aides would go to the pub and buy the glass and smash it. Because Bill Clinton's DNA would be on that beer glass. And we all know that Bill Clinton's DNA is a dangerous thing to leave lying around. <laughs> the Bishop of Oxford, also a member of the HFEA at one stage, chaired a House of Lords Select Committee on the subject of embryo research and gave it a clean bill of health. That was the price extracted by Parliament. A, a further committee, chaired by a bishop, to say it was OK, as long as the research was desirable and could be done in no other way. His committee reported in 2002 and laid to rest the fears of some politicians, giving the new law an even more respectable start. Litigation followed, but it turned out to be on the side of research too. Our judges dismissed the case brought by Josephine Quintavalli of the organization Comment on Reproductive Ethics, which is actually a very, very conservative religious organization, which has challenged just about every move forward made by the HFEA. But fortunately, British judges have shown a good understanding of the ethics and necessity of embryo research and have backed it all the way. We won every case except one, which, which is another story. I set out this background because it illustrates, in a constructive way, the part played and sometimes the struggles between the different factions in the regulation of embryo research in this country, which has nevertheless been brought to a successful waypoint. <coughs> the title of my talk tonight was inspired by a comment made to me when I appeared before a Commons Select Committee some years ago which was looking into the regulation of IVF and embryo research. I was just sitting down when an MP who was opposed to it all said to me, who do you think you are, he said, playing God. I explained that the role of God had been assigned to me under the Human Fertilization Embryology Act and that I did no more or less than what was remitted to the authority under the law of the land. And as we all know, be ye never so great, the law is above you, God included. What lay behind his comment revealed the struggle that has continued over 20 years between all the people who want to get their hands on this topic. The religious forces, individual politicians, government departments, clinicians, researchers, and the public, insofar as the public has a single voice. Who is going to control what goes on in IVF and embryology. Much discretion has been left to the regulatory body, the HFEA, which is a typical British way of dealing with a highly contentious and fast-moving issue. 
But every now and then, Parliament re-examines the issue and confirms the use of the discretion and redraws the lines within which the HFEA works. The balance has been kept up until now, and, but now, as I will explain, there is a threat to the independence of the body, the HFEA, which has held the ring and given Britain its worldwide reputation for dealing with these matters rationally. The MP, by the way, who challenged me, I'm glad to say, came to grief in subsequent political affairs and is no more to be heard of. <laughs> we can contrast this relatively rational and successful outcome with that of the US. Let me just go back for a minute to this. President Bush issued a directive in 2001 that limited federal funding to research only on the stem cells that already existed then. There were only 21 of them, and they became decreasingly useful as they got older. By the time Obama reversed this directive in 2009, another 1,000 or so stem cells had been created in the USA with the use of private money and the Obama directive allowed federal funding for work on them, but with limitations too. It's not a free-for-all. The National Institutes of Health in the States drafted guidelines in 2009 about this work, and it seemed that from 2009 that government-funded scientists in America could work on the 1,000 existing stem cell lines and on surplus in vitro fertilization and PGD embryos, that was embryos that were not needed but had been created for reproductive purposes. But even after the Obama vault fuss, there were still no federal funds for embryos created specifically for research, not for cloned embryos and not for animal-human hybrid embryos, which we're allowed to make, unlike in this country. Dickie Wicker, rather appropriate name, the Dickie Wicker Amendment, first introduced in 1996 in the US Congress and renewed every year in the US budget. It forbids the use of federal funds for the creation of an embryo for research. Not if the embryo is already there for reproductive purposes. You can't use money creating one for research, or research in which an embryo is destroyed or injured. In the face of two contradictory regulations, there remained uncertainty in the United States relating to the legal use of funds. Only very recently, a few weeks ago, in the case of Shirley and Sebelius in the States, the judge ruled that given the ambiguity of the word research in the Dickey Wicker Amendment, the American National Institutes of Health were reasonable in concluding that they could fund research using cell lines derived from embryos which are destroyed in the process, provided you don't create the embryo with federal funds. So it's loosened up, but not completely, not like here. In addition to all this expensive confusion in America, each American president in recent years has established a bioethics commission to deliberate on the issues involved, although those commission's opinions have no legal force. The current one is called the Presidential Commission, for the study of bioethical issues. Those commissions have not been held in high regard because it was thought that under President Bush, he appointed everyone to his bioethics commission that held conservative views that he would approve of. Whereas in this country, we have a more open system of appointment. We don't have a national bioethics commission in this country, though we have local ones. Because if you had a national one, who would choose the members? Would there have to be representatives, for example, from the Catholic Church, who are fundamentally opposed to any such research at all? What force would its opinions have? How would its views square with whatever Parliament decided? Supposing the Bioethics Commission said one thing, Parliament wants something else. And in fact, our law already incorporates ethical principles in the statutes, which assist in the determination of new developments and their application. Certainly, there would be fewer ethical concerns if IVF were generally available on the NHS and if there were no postcode lottery, which there is, in relation to the limited service that is available. The members of the HFEA are selected after public advertisement with a balance of lay and scientific members. They are committed to and limited to carrying out the legislated requirements of the Acts.
So anyone who was adamantly opposed to all embryo research could not properly be a member. By way of comparison, control of this research in the US is very much in the hands of the president, to a large extent in the hands of Congress, and it isn't expert. However, each state in America can and does regulate IVF and embryo research as it wills, and some, like California, have committed considerable resources to this and set up committees, not unlike the British structure. So we go in for democratic control. We don't tamper with all of this as much as they do in the States. For example, the rather leisured development and passage of the latest statute, the Human Fertilization Embryology Act 2008. It was preceded by consultation for about three years. Two new difficult issues arising in the new legislation were whether the creation of animal-human hybrid embryos for research was legal under the existing law, and whether there was room for efficiency by merging the Human Tissue Authority, which looks after just tissue, and the HFEA into one body. The pre-legislative scrutiny committee of the House of Lords came down in favor of a free vote on hybrid embryos. That's where you mix, as this picture shows, the cells of a human with that from an animal, quite often a cow. Uh, the cow DNA can go in a female egg or indeed even vice versa. So you end up with a mixture used for research. Now, the House of Lords came out against merging the two bodies, HTA and HFEA, because of the loss of expertise, the different ethical considerations applying to tissue on the one hand and reproduction on the other, and because the cost of each of them is very small. A new and permissive bill was passed relatively comfortably by the Commons and Lords and is now law as the Human Fertilization Embryology Act 2008. The greatest protest during its debate and passage came from members of the public in relation to these human hybrid embryos mixing man and animal, which evoked a fear of half man, half beast. People honestly thought that was going to happen, which, of course, it wasn't. The pictures you get in the newspapers are, by the way, very often misleading. Uh, when they're talking about embryos, they show you a picture of a fetus, you know, a baby sucking its thumb, which is not an embryo at all. Having said that this is a very secular country, with no widespread strong feelings about embryonic research... There is nevertheless, I sense, something of a backlash against science. There are strong doubters of every announced move forward. Even when stem cell progress is demonstrated, the antis claim that it's all a waste of time because there are no demonstrable results yet. I have no patience with this for a rather personal reason, and it's this. Last year saw the 50th anniversary of the invention of the laser. And my husband, when I married him, was a researcher in lasers before university cutbacks persuaded him to leave science for law, which he says is much better paid but not as intellectually satisfying. When he was doing this research, no one could have predicted 50 years ago all the uses in medicine and industry that the laser would be put to. The laser that my husband did his doctoral work on in the 60s enabled the laser that was used to improve my eyesight just a few weeks ago. It was blue skies research in those days when universities were allowed to get on with that. I only wish that such an era could return. I've been surprised occasionally by the depth of hostility to science, whether it's ill-informed about embryo research or the protests that we suffered for years in Oxford against the building of the new animal lab. Then there are the triple vaccine scaremongers and the lobby that will not accept a possible psychological element in ME. As a lawyer, I'm sorry to note that the libel law of the UK has in the past served to silence voices pressing for more questioning and more research. I was glad to see that Simon Singh, the journalist, won his battle 
against the Cairo practice on the ground of fair comment when he wrote a critical book about them. And this will hopefully make freedom of discussion in the press more confident. Now, the House of Lords, average age 68, was very progressive in this debate. That is, they were pretty keen on extensions to research allowed in the HFE Bill 2008, accepting all the extensions to research, whereas in the Commons, the debate was hijacked at one stage by the anti-abortionists. The Upper House, the House of Lords, does not have to worry about electoral unpopularity, which is another argument to consider when the country enters the debate about an elected house being allegedly better than an appointed one. I want to keep my job. The resentment of embryo research liberalism may have resulted in the very narrow defeat of my local MP, who was prominent in his defense of embryo research and was targeted by the animal liberationists and the anti-science factions which was a great shame. He was a great loss to expertise in the Commons. Now, in the Lords, it's much better. The House of Lords Select Committee on the Bill contained the following appointed scientific members. Lord Winston, you all recognise him. Lord Krebs. Lord Browers, of course, you recognise. Lord Patel of the RCOG. And Lord Rees. The House also has... Inter alia, Lord Stern for climate change, Lord Bob May, Patrick Jenkin, Lord Walton, and other eminent scientists. If you are tempted by an elected House of Lords, ask yourself who you would rather have in charge of scientific legislation. Alec Brewers or Nick Clegg? <laughs> Martin Rees or Chris Hoon? Thus, the House of Lords can fulfil what's been its main function in the last hundred years of revising and adding expertise to Commons proposals. You can see that I'm a believer in regulation of this area of science and in British-style democratic regulation. It's a question of building public confidence in what scientists do. Regulation is not about how excellent and trustworthy our clinicians and embryologists are. If that were the focus, we wouldn't need regulation in many walks of professional life. And the controversy surrounding the public body's bill, which aims to consolidate and abolish many quangos, would recede. It is easy in university surroundings like here, or amongst researchers and specialists, to forget how sensitive the issue of IVF and embryos is, and how very concerned the public is. If your name, like mine, is associated with embryo research, you are the recipient of hundreds of letters about it, not always peaceful or unthreatening ones. As Baroness Mary Warnock said in her esteemed report of 1984, which laid the foundations for the regulation of IVF here, the public want to know that some principles are involved and are being applied to remind scientists of the public good. It is also not to be forgotten that most of the infertility treatment in this country is private, and therefore a great deal of money is involved, and the need for protection all the greater. The HFEA is like no other quango. Its work touches deeply on the intimate lives of the one in six couples who cannot conceive naturally. It touches on the health of babies, on scientific research and cure for diseases now and in the future, on the profits of scientific companies and public morality. It is unique. It has an international reputation. It was a British first. It has, in my view, enabled the UK to lead the way in issues connected to embryology. Its record was a major factor in persuading Parliament to legislate to extend the areas of permitted embryo research in the last few years. The Department of Health has found the HFEA useful in deflecting the embarrassment or blame that could result if anything went wrong in IVF treatment, which it has, albeit rarely, and in giving assurance that, for example, animal hybrid embryos or the growth of eggs from tissue will be responsibly monitored. For 20 years, the device of the HFEA has served to capture the ethical elements of new discoveries 
and the proper delivery of those treatments in the clinics that it monitors. Yes, there have been problems. For example, the granting of licenses to do research has been said to be too slow, and the pursuit of doctors who may be in breach of the HFEA code of conduct may not have been undertaken as irreproachably as it should. But these defects can occur in any organisation and are not peculiar to the HFEA. Regulation in general is deeply unpopular because of its cost and the bureaucracy. It's in the spotlight right now because of the government's attempt to cut quangos in the public bodies bill. That bill started out listing hundreds of bodies that might be affected and it's now down to many fewer in its latest incarnation because so many of them have their devotees. Like the Hydra that Hercules fought, according to Greek legend, each head that he cut off was replaced by two more growing in the same spot. Thus it is with financial regulation by Quango, the FSA being replaced by two. And so it may be with the HFEA and the HTA if the government's plans are not thwarted. There is good regulation and there is bad regulation. We need it where there would be a risk to the interests of the public as a whole, to their welfare, their rights and their future if there were no regulation of a particular private or professional activity. That is where embryo research and infertility treatment are entering in. For many centuries, professions such as medicine and the law were trusted to self-regulate. And indeed, their professional pride was and is such that the strictest regulators are often one's own peers in a profession or business because there is self-interest in maintaining standards and quality of entry. But trust seems to have vanished from English public life for a variety of reasons the MPs' expenses scandal being only one manifestation. Recently, self-regulation has been under attack because of failings, real or perceived, in the professions. The Shipman inquiry into the deaths that that doctor caused. The Alderhay organs scandal, when organs were removed from deceased children and retained without their parents' consent. The Bristol Royal Infirmary inquiry into the paediatric cardiac unit all resulted from and fueled public loss of confidence in the medical profession over those particular issues. The modern requirement is that representation and regulation within a profession should be separated and that there should be a substantial lay presence on the regulatory boards, if not a majority. The same is true of the legal profession, financial regulation, the press and so on. Although there's much to be said for small specialist regulators, there is now a trend towards super regulators, combining different regulators who previously oversaw different parts of one industry or service. For example, Ofcom in relation to communications, the FSA and the Care Quality Commission. I am not convinced by the move to merge and create super regulators. We've had our financial meltdown. We should have learnt from the failings of that great big super regulator, the FSA, not to mention the perceived weakness of the CQC. So pausing there for a moment, one can readily see there's nothing to be gained from the present proposal to bring together the HFEA and the HTA and merge them both into the CQC while their research function will be moved to a new overarching scientific research body. This is the proposal in the current version of the Public Bodies Bill. No matter how bad the reputation of regulation in general is, there's a clear case for the HFEA. Safety has to be paramount, both of mothers and babies. We all expect taxi drivers to have done the knowledge. We expect those who take charge of food supplies and gas installations to be properly trained and not to put our health at risk. There are areas of life where the public needs to trust those who are in charge of their physical safety for a while in a situation where that member of the public has no specialist knowledge. I think it's better for such regulation to be conducted at arm's length from the government, for it may be government failings which are at the root of the failures in regulated activities. And the government might not want to call attention to its own failings in this regard. 
It's better for such quangos not to be funded by the government, but by fees and licenses raised from the regulated community. And so it is with the HFEA. The greater element of its funding comes from the patients and the, the labs, and the direct government grant is only 2 million out of a 7 million budget. The code of practice, which I showed you, runs to 270 pages. It is a melange of high-level principles and detailed guidance. And although it mentions outcomes, I wouldn't describe it as following this particular style of regulation known as outcomes-focused regulation. In medicine, it's too late to wait for an outcome to discover that things have gone wrong. There is a need, as there is in the barrister's profession, to know what to do in detail as you're going along with protocols in the clinic or in the courtroom. There have been remarkably few professional failures in IVF and research, which is a tribute to the code. The people who operate under it may feel they have a safe haven if they work within the code. They're protected on the whole from litigation and the disapproval of those who are uneasy with this field of research. So why on earth should it be slated for merger and consolidation in the public bodies bill? One understands that the government is driven by cost cutting, but as I said, there's hardly any money involved there. And it's not as if regulation will be lessened if the HFEA and HTA are merged into the CQC, because the law on this field of regulation will remain. Lord Winston, for example, has for years criticised the HFEA because couples are charged exorbitant prices for IVF treatment. He's right about that, but it's not within the remit of the reg regulatory body to control prices in a market situation. The cure for overpricing would be competition from the NHS. But then we're in straightened economic circumstances. And I understand the arguments that it's not right for the NHS to spend on infertility when they could be spending on cancer, old people, and so on. I don't agree, mind you, that the treatment of infertility is a lifestyle choice, as some say, especially those who don't want the NHS to spend on it. But I can understand the difficulties posed by the need to prioritise. So 80% of the IVF treatment is very expensive and private. All the more, then, the need for a body to confront the ethical questions that continue to arise, especially when new treatments and new research continue to present themselves. Some people, for example, Lord, w Lord Winston and the esteemed researcher Professor Alison Murdoch of Newcastle, have said that IVF and embryology are no longer unique and don't need special attention. It's rather sad, I think, that the familiarity that a doctor must develop when treating many patients over the years leads him or her to conclude that the treatment is not unique. One has but to visit a clinic or have someone in the family experience for the first time the emotional and physical depths of IVF to realize that it's special. The government agrees because they propose to stick to the primary legislation and not amend it. And I think the public believe that IVF and embryology are special, for their intelligence and emotions are engaged by every new development. For example, in treating mitochondrial disease, in screening embryos, in using stem cells for stroke patients. And the people who have terrible diseases are passionately committed to this area. The uniting of eggs and sperm with the resultant possibilities can never be routine unless one is very hard-boiled. It is also said that the USA manages very well without widespread national regulation. That is a false analogy. America has been home to some of the scandals that have echoed around the world, whether it's a clinician using his own sperm, octuplets, there they are, born to a single mother, or the sale of eggs and sperm on the internet by needy college students, can you see, seeking special egg donor, 15,000 to 25,000? If you are a UPenn student or graduate, Caucasian, athletic, five foot seven to five foot 11, German, English, East European or Irish, very attractive or pretty, age 21 to 32, kind and fun personality, 
please consider being our egg donor. I think if you did that in this country, not only would you be in trouble with the HFEA, you'd have the entire race relations industry down on you like a shot. This is not the road we want to go down. And payment for eggs and sperm are not allowed here. If the HFEA is merged into the CQC, there'll be just as much regulation. No more freedom to do what one wants. Consent will be needed exactly as before, and so will licenses. Taking the processes into the Care Quality Commission can be guaranteed to be no faster, no less bureaucratic, no cheaper, just worse. IVF is not routine, because although it's practiced very often, any one treatment can throw up new ethical issues, such as saviour siblings and the elimination of disease, and the science progresses every day. We also have to safeguard the great database of the HFVA with all the details of the anonymous fathers and the treatment. The Care Quality Commission doesn't have expertise. If the HFVA is merged into it, we will lose our international standing. The scientists might suffer a loss of public confidence in what they do. We would not have the same strong voice speaking for progress in this country and abroad. And one would go backwards. In the meantime, the shadow of destruction hangs over the HFEA. This doesn't mean to say that there's no case for reform. I'd like to see the removal from the law of excessive confidentiality provisions, which block follow-up research on IVF babies. I'd like to see the regulator given power over the charges and menu of the treatments offered by private IVF work. I'd like to see greater enforcement powers against the occasional rogue doctor or clinic. I presided over a tri tribunal in my time which struck off a doctor uh, from this work. He promptly went to the States and set up there and I think came back here. I expect efficiencies could be found in the back offices and the paperwork of research regulation could be improved and speed it up. But my experience was that most of the time, the HFEA was urged to carry out what they call light touch regulation and only inspect clinics that were known to be at risk. But as soon as something went wrong, then we were urged by the Department of Health, who would be in a terrible tizzy if it was in the Daily Mail, we were urged to be the most intense regulators at all costs, especially when these embarrassing stories appeared in the press. For example, um, an electricity cut causing the loss of embryos or a mix-up through, through human error, obviously with tragic consequences and probably not avoidable unless you station someone in the laboratory 24 hours a day, which simply isn't possible. I'm not convinced that there's only one cheap, an efficient way to regulate. It's horses for courses. Who then should control IVF and embryology? I've made it plain that by any regulatory theory, this is an area that needs protection for the sake of the public, the health of mothers and babies, and to control gung-ho doctors and scientists who might otherwise be just too keen to achieve a first or a breakthrough in a field that might be unethical and dangerous. I have other lectures and slides with lots of jolly stories about women of 62 having babies, and my encounter with the famous Signor Antinori of Rome, who would do absolutely anything for money. And uh, when I met him, being a regulator, he thought I was a woman seeking treatment. I was an extremely aged woman by then, but there we are. That's the sort of thing that goes on in this field. The competitors in the field of control are Parliament itself, government departments, organisations representing patients, embryologists, clinicians, national bioethics committees would like to get in on the act and hospital ethics committees, the individual doctor or scientist, the patient untrammeled wanting to do whatever will succeed for them, the churches, human rights organisations, or a statutory authority composed of persons, whether scientific or lay, chosen for their expertise in open competition. 
you can readily see my preference. As a lawyer with a soft spot for the Constitution, I must defend the role of Parliament and the successful way it has so far delegated powers for many years at a time to a regulatory authority. They should leave well alone. As Hillard Belloc said, always keep a hold of nurse for fear of finding something worse. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to take questions. Anything that um, this audience can do to, um, I don't know how it works, there are letters to the editor, or is there anything you'd like us to do if we agree with you? You mean in relation to the states? Yeah. No, well, no, no, in relation to uh, keeping uh, the, this body, this Quango, independent oh, right, and doing yeah, its good right work. To the, right to the Minister for Health, the Secretary, I can't remember who it is now. Right to the Minister for Health, I know who it is in the House of Lords, it's Earl Howe. Okay. Is it Lansley? Yeah, he's got a lot on his plate at the moment because of the NH bill that's, that's, that's going through Parliament. But certainly letters to the Department w would help. A number of reputable and very well-respected scientific and medical bodies have written, and it does make a difference. Or even the letters to the Times, or at worst, the Telegraph, would, you know, <laughs> would make a difference. Thank you. I actually quite think the Department would like to get off this hook. I've got a feeling they would love to just let it go because we've given them so much hassle over it. And there's an amendment going through the Commons at the moment that would keep the HFEA. And for the sake of two million, they probably spent two million on just defending the status quo. You alluded to the um, this very strict confidentiality that prevents a lot of research, which is something we've encountered with the HFEA. Could you just elaborate on what the basis for that was? Because it seems to have yes. a proportion to other equally sensitive areas. I know. Much more uh, access yes. for data. I think it was the price that was paid for getting that regulation off the ground in um, the original act of uh, 2000. Um, and people were still a bit wary about what was going to happen. And people were shocked and not used to the idea of anonymous sperm donors and families that looked as though the husband was the father when he wasn't, and all the things that emerged that we've now got rather used to, but they weren't used to. And I think the price for it was this extreme confidentiality. There's a computer locked up in the HFEA. Uh, you can't, it, it was so confidential, even when it broke down, you, know, you couldn't get anyone to repair it because they weren't um, sufficiently um, uh, permitted to get through all those barriers. I think that's the reason, and I suppose embarrassments that would be much less now. I think now people don't mind talking about that they've had IVF. A lot of people come out with it. But I think it was embarrassing 10, 11 years ago. But now, I mean, I'm not asking, but you know, given the number of people in this room, that one in six couples have a problem, there's going to be a whole lot of people in this room who've had or needed assistance or whose close family members have. Every dinner party I go to, let me assure you, especially in Hampstead, <laughs> someone will take me on one side at the end and say, me, my daughter, my sister, whatever, needs some advice. So it's widespread now. So I think it's time to let go of some of that confidentiality. And also, it's very hard to do research. I mean, my secret fear is that maybe, you know, in 20 years' time, someone might find that there was something wrong in the way that children were treated or brought into this world by IVF. And the only way to do the research, really, is by follow-up. But parents who've had an IVF baby don't want researchers knocking on the door saying, we know you've got an IVF baby, can we do a, a study? So it's a really difficult issue. Uh, they don't want people coming around saying, we know your husband is not the father of your baby and we'd like to check out your baby and, and so on. They don't want it. So it's a very difficult issue, that. There must be a way of doing anonymized research, I would have thought. Uh, so again, thank you very much. Um, you'll be more than aware that worldwide there's been a lot of companies set up 
uh, offering uh, stem cell treatments to patients, typically uh, purifying these uh, cells from peripheral blood and just re-injecting them either peripherally or, or to diseased areas. My question is, do you think in the UK we've got the legislation that protects our patients from those sort of uh, companies and that sort of practice? I think there are people in the audience who are better able to answer that than I am. The HFEA's remit stopped with the... Um, it covers the production of the embryos and the removal of the stem cells. After that, it part, there, there are several other bodies. You probably know better than I do. There are several other baby, uh, bodies with, with you know, different medical um, acronyms that take care of that. But I'm sorry I'm not expert. That, that was one stage beyond what we did. I did look into it once, and there were several bodies. I have heard it said, mind you, that there's something of a gap in regulation between the production of the stem cells and their bringing into use for clinical purposes. That may be the case. I'm sorry I don't know more about it. That's something I should get up on. Yeah, I, th I think that's true, actually. There is a gap. But I wouldn't give up hope. I, I, I do think that um, either embryonic or adult stem cells, one day, too late for me, will produce a great source of renewed organs. I think people have been a bit too pessimistic about it. Um, I think it will come to pass one day. Baroness Deitch, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm, I was reminded by something that uh, our MP, uh, Julian Huppert, had said a couple of weeks ago that I'd heard him say that uh, the UK is one of three theocracies in the world, the other being the Vatican and that great bastion of regulatory wisdom, Iran. Um, and my question is, I'm kind of trying to read between the lines of something you said, perhaps, um, if it's not my place to ask, then please do tell me. Um, but I was trying to figure out when you said that certain, certain kind of legislation, I, maybe it was, in fact, the establishment of the HFEA, had to, um, your words were, that was the price, that it had to be screened by the clergy members of the House of Lords first. Was that correct? Well, I Do I understand that in, correctly? I wouldn't say it was screened by the clergy. Um, there was concern about stem cells. The vote got through and the government promised that there would be a further select committee to look at it. And they then put the Bishop of Oxford in the chair. I don't think it was that the clergy should approve, but obviously it looked good to have a bishop who just happens to be very expert on stem cells because he was a member of the HFEA. And actually, I don't know what the situation is now, but I had three bishops while I was there. Richard Holloway of Edinburgh, who was absolutely wonderful. Uh, Michael Nazir Ali, who was a bit more conservative. And then Richard Harris. And they were all really very good on this issue. And it, you know, it does make it look more rounded. As far as theocracies go, well, we've got the established Church of England. But that is not a church that seems to be very opposed to embryo research, really. It's the Catholic minority. And what I found is, as you go further south and east in Europe, you get more and more opposition. I did once lecture on this in the Vatican. The food was absolutely wonderful. The wine was out of this world. But they sat and looked at me. And if there could have been excommunication by look, you know, I, I, I would have been, you know, smitten. They were deeply, deeply disapproving. I understand that, you know, and you get it in the States as well. But what is very interesting, and again, it's a topic for another lecture, I haven't got time for it, is to study the different attitudes to this as you go around the world. Absolutely fascinating. Um, the unrestrained private work in the States, and yet a huge body of opinion that's quite religiously conservative. This country, nominally C of E, but really anything goes, Italy used to be completely liberal, no legislation. They couldn't bring themselves to do it. It's now very, very conservative. Um, in Israel, I think they spend more per head and have more doctors than any other country in the world because they're very pro-family. And yet, um, uh, the Arab population in Israel continue to keep marrying their cousins. And that's not, I haven't got time to go into that, but you probably all know that that's a rather risky thing to do even though they have whole villages full of deaf children and so on because of the uh, inbreeding and everything offered to them. So there is a sort of um, huge um, stubbornness in sticking to the old ways on one hand and with the rest of the population a willingness to spend anything to get a baby and have a healthy baby. In, in Cyprus and Iran, they're insisting on premarital testing to see if you're a carrier of beta thalassemia. 
and they've managed to stamp it out just about in Cyprus. I think you can't get married unless you get tested for uh, beast thalassemia. And I always thought, well, what happens if you're madly in love and then you find out uh, you're a carrier? Well, the answer is you can get married and then um, to avoid having a baby with beta thalassemia, you could use pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, produce your embryos in the lab and have them tested to see if they carry, if, if they've got PGD and so on. But it's a fascinating topic to see the cultural differences. And that's why no one universal treaty will ever work on this. It's impossible, not even in Europe. You've got every shade of opinion in Europe from north to south. Certainly, the marrying of first cousins isn't wholly foreign to some parts of East Anglia as well. It's <laughs> <laughs> managed to be a part of the Baroness, thank you uh, for, a, for an excellent lecture. Um, I, I'm a clinician uh, in reproductive medicine, and in common with uh, a large proportion of my colleagues, I've always been very skeptical about the HFEA. But recently, I had the experience of leading a unit through its first ever HFEA, so it's a brand new NHS. IVF facility that we've taken through its first inspection. And that allowed me to work with a number of HFEA inspectors. And I have come to the conclusion that they added so much value to the unit that it would be a real loss to lose them. Because of their expertise and the way they've worked with us in improving our processes, even before our first patients come through the door, the unit is already a better governed unit, I think. Our processes are sounder clinically, scientifically, and just process-wise for the expert input that we got from them. And we didn't have to pay anything for it other than the license fee. I think that's, that's, that's tremendous work. And, and someone should recognize that the patients are being benefited by this expert uh, body, uh, uh, this body of expertise. Well, I'm very pleased to hear you say that because I know a lot of clinicians just don't like having to deal with the HFEA. They feel it is an imposition and a stranglehold. But the government is not going to drop regulation. It would don't, if they do what they plan to do, it will simply come at you from another direction and maybe not with as much expertise. I think Lord Winston, with whom I always cross swords, seems to believe that you know, if you merge the HFA, there'll just be no more regulation. You can do whatever he likes. That's not the case. Um, you won't be able to do whatever you like. Though I, I quite understand the frustration of some doctors because I've developed this theory, having regulated... Uh, reproductive medicine doctors, having regulated what they call talent at the BBC, having regulated QCs, having regulated health and safety prof and professors at Oxford, that there are certain areas of life where you're going to expect big egos. I mean, they go where no man uh, has gone before. So you're not going to get shrinking violets. Um, they're difficult people to control, and they honestly believe they're doing their best. But there won't be no regulation. And I just think it's better to stick with what you're used to rather than have it merge into the CQC with all that that might mean. It wouldn't be better, that's for sure. Um, I, I, I was interested in, um, in what you said about the role of the House of Lords and the House of Commons in passing legislation in this area. Um, would I be right in understanding that, in practice, the role of the Lords is essentially advisory in the sense that if some new legislation was defeated in the House of Commons, um, it couldn't then be overruled in the Lords, and conversely, if legislation was approved in the Commons and then blocked in the Lords, legislation of this kind could be brought back by the Commons and would, yes. after some delay, be passed? That's exactly it. That's right. Um, uh, ever since 1911, exactly a century, the Lords has not been able to block um, Commons bills. The understanding is if, there's something in the, if something has been promised in the manifesto, the Lords won't stand in the way. They often make amendments and the Commons rejects them and then they come back in what is called ping-pong. And quite often the Commons gets fed up and says, all right, all right, you know, we'll do that amendment. So we do have some effect. And we spend a lot longer on uh, reviewing a bill line by line by line than the Commons gets time to. Commons has a guillotine. House of Lords does not. House of Lords can go on as long as is necessary. And all these people, I said 68 was the average age. Uh, believe me, some of them are a lot more than that. And they're sitting bolt upright with their eyes wide open at midnight. No problem. 
and they're uh, busy revising word by word, line by line legislation that comes. And I must say, I do enormously admire the um, scientific expertise there. I had great fun with these PowerPoint slides. I could have given you another 20 pictures of distinguished scientists in the House of Lords, um, just so many. And with the Commons, I was just you know, upset that someone like Evan Harris, whom I greatly admired, um, lost by a few hundred votes, I think because of the anti-science vote. Yeah, so the Lords has a delaying and scrutinising effect. If you get rid of us, we're appointed, you'll end up with more John Prescott, Anne Whittacombe, Clegg, and all the rest of them. I'm sure that's great, but, you know, that's the alternative. It's quite a disturbing picture of Lord Winston there, isn't it? Cuddling the baby. It's <laughs> as if it's, it's a rather devious plan for it. Uh, are there any other questions? Mine's not a question. for IVF. So things have certainly moved on. And my consultant said, you know, if I was you, I could offer you an operation, but you'd only have a 30% chance I'd go away and consider adoption, which is what I did. But then proved them wrong. I had two children of my own later on. You know, and every time I came back, he said, what are you doing here? But it was at, tw I, at 28 when he told me, I thought, that was it. What am I going to do now? You know, and IVF, you know, I know people have been through it and have used their life savings for it. You know, and ask why cannot you know they have this on the NHS and why have they got to do that? So, I think it's something that should be for, for people um, to have. There's no upper age limit. Um, it's just that the, the success rates really drop dramatically once the woman is 40 or over. You get the occasional one, but it really drops dramatically. The pictures of women that you've seen who have babies at 62 or 65 have done so with donated eggs. The baby has grown in their body, but it's donated eggs. If you're using your own eggs, after about 40, the, the success rates really drop off. Now, of course, the success rates are now much better than they were years ago. Um, on the train on the way here, I was reading the obituary of someone in the Times who, according to the Times, he was very surprised to have become a father at 71. If someone becomes a father at 71, we all say, oh, great, nudge, nudge, you know, terrific. Um, so I suppose, arguably, why not with a woman? And yet there is still quite a lot of sort of just instinctive feeling that it's wrong uh, to, to treat a very old woman anyway. Um, the other thing that's happening, which is interesting for career women, is the freezing of eggs. This was something that we allowed in my time. I'm very interested in this because it, it started like, like this. If a very young woman, say 25 or 30, gets cancer and she's going to have chemotherapy or radiotherapy, the effect of that treatment could be to destroy her eggs and her fertility. So if there's time, we gave permission for doctors to remove her eggs before treatment, freeze them, and then if she's well and recovered, she could use her eggs, which have stayed young and untouched. And we all know that men going off to war and so on have often frozen their sperm uh, before they go. Now, having given permission for young women with cancer to freeze their eggs, there was then no reason not to extend that permission to all women, for whatever reason, if they wanted to freeze their eggs. Otherwise, it would have been discriminatory. So the situation now is, you know, much of the reason for infertility treatment is women aren't getting married or finding partners until much older. They're not trying to have a baby until they're 35 or so. And then it's, it's not working. So with the freezing of eggs, you can have your career girl getting on with her career. She freezes her eggs at 25 or 30. She can't find Mr. Right. And the years go by. And when she eventually finds him, or Mr. Average, or Mr. He Will Do, um, she still got her eggs frozen in the condition they were when she was uh, 25. Though the unfreezing and the success rate is still quite problematic, but no doubt that will improve. So the age thing has, has really undergone quite a revolution. Um, thank you. It's very interesting. And my question is to address maybe something you touched on earlier. Um, in your experience in the States, is obviously this is a very partisan issue. Um, are you finding that those against, um, obviously being the right, 
uh, is it more of a religious issue or is it a states, right, states' rights issue, which you touched on with California obviously having a yes. lot of funding? I think it's, um, it's both. I think the reason why it's so difficult to have regulation in the states is pre precisely because there are so many states with their own um, legislative powers. The FDA has got some jurisdiction over the whole lot, but that's one of the problems. But the other is they just seem to be much, much more religious, whether it's Catholic or sort of devoutly against any tampering with the embryo in a quite striking way. I mean, we're the ones with an established church, but driving through Oxford on a Sunday morning, you don't see anyone going to church. Go to the States, you know, they're all, they're all out there going to church. Um, so it's a question of a mixture of the difficulty of legislating and the religious objections. Even Obama has not completely lifted all the restrictions on the use of embryos for research. And as I said, Bush said it was for the religious right, but I, I'm not sure that was his main motive. I don't know. Thank you. It's been a really uh, great discussion and a very interesting question and answer session. Just going to pass back to Dr. Edward Gillingwood of the Department of Continuing Education, who just makes some closing remarks and about the things. So, firstly, I'd like to thank you, Gordon, for chairing so ably. Thank you very much. And of course, Thank you to you, Ruth, for a hugely stimulating lecture this evening. And as a small token of our thanks, I have a gift for you, um, which gives you the history of Maddingley Hall and the gardens um, to take thank away. Thank you very much. So thank it's you a beautiful much. place, so that, that would be nice to have. Thank, thank you very you. much indeed. So, of course, it goes without saying that um, events such as these this evening um, don't happen by, the, by themselves. So I'd like to thank my colleagues, without whom we wouldn't be here this evening. Um, also, I, I hope that I'll see some of you back here in future, not only for um, Maddingly lectures in the future, but perhaps for Maddingly concerts and, importantly, studying with us. Um, we have an awful lot to catch your imagination we have between 8,000 and 10,000 student enrolments each year offering um, courses in um, subjects for personal intellectual enrichment, but also for professional um, development and diversification, short courses through to longer award-bearing courses through to part-time master's degrees of the university. And also, of course, our summer schools, which bring well over 1,000 people to Cambridge each year. So I do hope that I will see some of you back here again and um, on your way out perhaps you'll pick up uh, brochures that tell you more about what we do. So thank you, I hope you've enjoyed this evening um, and as you make your way out could I invite you to leave by this door behind me and uh, make your way down the stairs um, and then a safe journeys home. Thank you very much. <laughs>